Focus. Today, we're focusing on focus. Imagine if we were only ever drawn to the allure of new and exciting opportunities, whether in our personal or professional lives. Shiny penny syndrome has become increasingly prevalent in our fast-paced, hyper-connected world. But in this episode, we'll be channeling our energy into the topic of focus. And joining me for this conversation is Segalen Branchen. Welcome to In Good Company, Segalen. It's great to have you here. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you for having me. Oh, well, it's a delight and we are very grateful for you uh, taking some of your time to uh, to be with us today. So thank you ever so much. Um, we we always start these episodes with in the same way, which is to, to give our audience uh, a chance to get to know you a bit better. So we sort of set a little challenge, which is to, to tell us about yourself in 60 seconds. So I'm fascinated about the topic of people's journey of self-discovery and self-actualization. For me, it's about finding, nurturing, and leveraging people's strength, always keeping a holistic view of person, so physical, emotional, mental, spiritual level. I've spent the past nine years immersed in the world of corporate learning and development. I'm currently L&D manager at the AGS Academy. Mm -hmm. I'm a coach as well. And throughout my career, I've had the privilege of diving into various sectors. And I've always seen how crucial effective people management and leadership are, no matter the field. So I feel very privileged to contribute at my own level throughout my role at AGS. Yeah, well, I, it's, um, I, you have certainly an impressive resume. I had a look at your LinkedIn earlier. And I was particularly interested, which we're going to come back to a bit later, but I was particularly interested that you kind of devoted your life to people development after a, a, a span in, as far as I can work out, space work, <laughs> being a, a, an engineer in, um, in that sector. So I was, yeah, I was fascinated to, to learn a bit about that. And we will come back to that in a bit later on. Um, but first, um, I just wanted to, to refer back to what we talked about in the introduction which is the, the the shiny penny syndrome. So you actually joined uh, an internal impact meeting not that long ago. Uh, and kind of when you brought up the shiny penny syndrome, it kind of resonated so much within the room um, that uh, we kind of wanted to, which is why we, one of the reasons why we wanted to get you on this podcast was to to find out more about what you meant about that and kind of, and what other other people in other organizations could learn from it as well. So perhaps first, if you could explain what you mean when you say shiny penny, shiny penny syndrome, and then we can kind of work into the, what impact you see that on having, uh, having on in organizations. Well, happy that it piqued your curiosity, just like it did <laughs> with me. I did not coin the term. And when I heard about it, uh, about the shiny penny concept, it did resonate also very much on a personal level uh, for me. Mm -hmm. My top strength is love of learning. Uh, I have a curior curiosity that spans multitude of topics. And always have this constant pull toward new interests that kept on diverting me from really acting upon what I learned. So I felt stuck quite often because of that. Uh, then once I've put a label on, on this concept, I could see it at play all around me. So the shiny penny represent the new, hot, fancy ID that draws our attention away from what we are uh, currently doing. Mm. And um, it's the new book, it's the latest hype. We tend to compare the excitement and the luster of the new ID, the so-called shiny penny, to what has become a bit dual in what we already have or what we already do. Now, linking that back to organization, typically shiny pennies are new technologies, new project added on top of the work without really finishing, concluding, or learning uh, anything properly. Mm -hmm. And I believe that one major, major threat of that is lack of focus. So organization, teams, and individual keep adding new projects and priorities without intentionally, and I put a big line under intentionally because that's a 
major point for me, uh, without intentionally assessing against their objectives. So we've seen in the impact of that uh, in various forms, but it will resonate with most people. Resource misallocation, low quality of deliverables, employees burnout, strategic misalignment, and so on. Yeah, I, I mean, it's I, as it, as you mentioned, it did resonate. I th- and I think everybody, uh, that there's got to be a time where shiny penny syndrome is a good thing because, of course, it can. Uh, it's interesting to find that that I suppose definition between shiny penny syndrome and uh, agility, I guess, because of course that there's there's going to be some some similarities, but also it in some cases it can be necessary but i guess in a lot of cases it can be detrimental to the overall organization's organizational strategy so what i mean what impact have you maybe seen over the years in your career of of where shiny penny, penny syndrome has had a maybe a detrimental effect to an organizational strategy well um engagement of people because they feel a loss of control over their workload or their priorities would be the first that comes to my mind. Also, um, the difficulty to frame the end goal, the f- yeah. what does finish look like? Yeah. Uh, when do we, how do we progress if we cannot see the finish line? Mm-hmm. I, th- I think that's that's important. And um, coming back to your point on shiny penny not being necessarily bad and that we have to find the the right way to frame it because indeed we need to to adapt to new trends anyway and we have to look out for those. I think the important two words there are, as I mentioned, intentional, being intentional on what we are looking or running after. And the second one is integrity. is it really what we should be doing? Um, so those are elements to take into the equation, I think, to balance a bit. Yeah, I guess it d- depends on the pace at which you were the address the the shiny penny. Like, how, do you just jump jump in all guns blazing, or actually, is it better to to take a step back and calculate what it is that you're trying to achieve? So yeah, I, yeah, I can see that. And I, I guess from we've kind of talked about it on an organizational level. But I guess it can also filter down to individuals as well. The, I mean, pe- people, especially if they're on a career path, you know, they'll have a, a goal, a development aim. Um, they'll maybe sign up for an opportunity. Uh, and I guess, is it off, all too often it's easy to put this off? With, and as you said, engagement levels drop. So looking at, shiny penny and making time how do you kind of balance that with making time for a learning opportunity and and is this a challenge you've seen and what can be done to counteract it well i've observed it becoming more prevalent particularly in the context of remote training Mm -hmm. people initially see all kind of opportunities they could take for training and those trainings become their shiny penny i would say yeah <laughs> with with the risk that at some point when the training comes closer if it's not really an objective they have set mindfully for themselves uh, they do late cancel no show or then multitask behind their screens i i believe that this phenomena is related to two cultural issues that we are uh, facing today. So the lack of focus, the topic of today, and the lack of intentionality. Again, I come back to to this one. Um, We navigate through learning and development without clear direction, merely going with the flow. So we see an opportunity, we might find it appealing at that time, but if we don't, if we cannot link it to something a goal we have set for ourselves, then mm-hmm. chances are that we won't deeply engage with the training. So um, to counteract this, I wanted to share uh, three leads related to the context of learning and development. And the first is fostering awareness. Um, until individual and organization see this pattern, they cannot address it. Mm-hmm. 
a reality check can be very powerful. At least it has been for me. <laughs> then it's keeping the basics of psychology in mind when developing the training. Mm -hmm. So we know, for example, that people can focus for a certain amount of time. Literature will give different uh, time. Let's, let's say roughly 30 to 40 minutes and that pe people need a short break. So taking that into account and not having more than three to four big blocks, uh, one after the other. Also make sure that you are not building yourself uh, or introducing distraction. For example, if you're using a, a platform and the platform keep having pops up with suggestion from some kind of AI in the background, you should look at that from a critical uh, eye, with a critical eye. And the third uh, thing was to reward progress and consistency. Mm -hmm. Uh, it can help motivate individual as they see themselves progressing. And as I say, they can see a finish line. It's not something too far in the distance. Also, uh, progress can be through the use of uh, pro providing badges, for example, or integrating what I refer to as LEAP, so learning application projects, mm -hmm. where uh, people take action based on their learning in their context. So that really can anchor their, their learning. But ultimately, we have to indeed find the right balance between individual discipline and organizational support and encouraging focus and consistency while allowing flexibility and personalization. So difficult to do, exciting to do. <laughs> yeah, and I, there was a few bits I picked up on there, and one of them is I thought was quite interesting. And of course, it, it, probably rightly so, but you know, with this, with this much more remote or hybrid working environment we find ourselves in, um, do you think that that's put? A, do you think that's been an extra sort of factor now that we work from home environments or we work from remote environments where, and as you say, there's that, there's so easy to get distracted on your own computer, whether it's by whatever you find, uh, whatever you might be, else you might be working on. Do you think just physical location, as in not in an office block, has an effect on your ability to kind of focus on um, what it is that you're working on, whether it's learning or? Well, I think we owe it to yourself to figure out for each of us what helps focus or what mm -hmm. hinders focus. Uh, you're talking about location. Uh, for some people, it's going to be super important, the location to focus. Uh, I myself need a quiet space. But I have friends and colleagues who say that they love working from a cafe, for example because there is some kind of background noise that, that helps them. So as such, the important thing is to explore our own needs and um, set up the rituals that work for us to, to foster uh, focus. Now, it's easy to put a lot on the uh, remote thing uh, with the pop-ups and the email, but it's also very easy to turn all those things off and as, as we see for other things, people neglect the most basic things, just as switching your mailbox, for example, switching yeah. off your mailbox or uh, putting the sound uh, down of any, any pops or bips, whatever. Yeah. So as such, I still see that there is value on, 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 the, on the remote training, definitely. Uh, it's up to us to find how to make it work for ourselves. Well, it's yes, and I think so. There's a lot of a lot of onus there on the individual, on the learner, on the employee. What advice could you give to, or what role maybe the leaders play in helping their teams and employees gain that focus? What, where do you think that they can support the the, the learners? First and foremost, the leader can ensure that the important goals are clearly defined. Mm -hmm. We talked about seeing the, the end goal, having a finish line. And I think that's a role of the leader to, with the person, with the colleague, see uh, what's the finish line, what does success look like? Because without that finish line, it's difficult to stay committed. 
Second, uh, there should be a continuous discussion around priorities within the team because we all face a dynamic context where it's important to be flexible and change of focus is sometimes necessary, but it has to be an intentional choice. Mm -hmm. So I often challenge people when I coach with, with the question, if you say yes to this, what are you saying no to? So that's another point. I also believe that leaders have a responsibility to foster and facilitate conversation on how could the team be more focused. So example, and that's not an exhaustive list, uh, but um, are all of our meetings necessary? Are we working on the important task or mer merely doing email management? Are there unspoken roles that we should bring into the open? Uh, example being maybe some team members feel that they have to answer every email within 30 minutes while mm. it has never been uh, stated and it might not be necessary. Some job might require it, other not. So it's important to bring them out. And could we set, for example, half a day, no meeting for our team? These are the kind of discussion that would allow for some space that could be dedicated to focus time. And then lastly, <laughs> easier said than done, at least it's for me a difficult one, it's keeping people accountable. Mm -hmm. uh, so if we come back to an example of, of a training, as a leader, get curious about what your employee has learned, uh, challenge how they will put into practice and make sure that you follow up on expected changes. So those are a few leads maybe to nurture uh, focus. Yeah, I think what I've picked up on there is a lot of it stems around conversation, check-ins, regular regular com communication between the le leader and the the learner. Um, I, yeah, I think that and and both and I think that goes both ways. So going back to again, the the onus on the individual. It's if if they feel like they need extra support, they should reach out for that support and not just kind of yeah, it's a dance. Away. yeah it certainly is it certainly is um and i wanted to kind of um ask you a bit more about kind of you and your experience and your role so as a as a learning and development manager and as you mentioned earlier coach i guess there must be some givens that always have to be included in an organizational development plan so what are you are you seeing as the prominent themes at the moment? Are there are there any new shiny pennies to coin that phrase? Are there any uh, so are there any shiny pennies or upcoming trends on the horizon? Or we're we kind of looking back to basics. Well, luckily for me, because I love learning, there are always new uh, new trends on the horizon as mm -hmm. the technology and the, the economy and the culture keep evolving. So, as an example. The theme of uh, diversity inclusion is high on our agenda, yeah. and it's very rightfully so, I would say. It was not some years ago, and I do hope that in a not so far away future, it won't be necessary anymore. So we, mm. we, we do see that some topics come and then go. One major one, as we speak, is, of course, generative AI. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe in some in some month or year, it will be so much in our everyday life that development uh, won't be necessary on, on that anymore. So we have to make ourselves ready for those challenges, to stay informed, to assess the latest trends, and to make informed decisions uh, whether or not we act upon upon these trends given our specific context. So that's mm -hmm. how we will keep growing. Yet and you mentioned it in your in your questions, we will always come back to some basics because leadership is grounded in psychology mm -hmm. and our brain did not evolve as quickly as technology. So we're always back on very um, important topic of self-awareness, awareness of others, empathy, connection, communication. You mentioned conversation. Uh, that's a big chunk of the work we are work we are doing with uh, impact for our leaders. Mm. That includes conflict management, giving feedback, motivation. Um, but yeah, the list can go on. But uh, this type of, of skills, we come back over and over again, independently of the level of the leaders we are working with. Yeah, I think there's some... Um... 
there's some key, definitely key points that you picked up on there, which of course the the hot topics, which and they'll all be they'll always like you said, it is a bit of a dance. There are there will always be hot topics that that come in and out of um, as we go through our our lives and our careers. The the a big one, of course, as you've said, diversity, equity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. We've got. Um, We've we've been doing a lot of work around that ourselves with with various different clients, but also hearing from different people about it as well. It's been it's been super fascinating. And then of course a big one on the horizon, of course, climate change is is not to be ignored. And so there's lots of things that do need to be addressed and that need to be discussed and learnt about in organisations, um, in order to to kind of help tackle tackle some of the world world's challenges. So yeah, you've. Um, You've kind of picked up on a few good points there, and you also mentioned um, working that you're working with Impact, which we and and you are currently working with Impact. And I, so, I wanted to ask you a little bit about how the the learning with Impact has worked for you. And we don't we don't often ask to to, to for our guests to talk about the work that we're that that we're doing with them, but the. I suppose this is more a question about the the methodology of experiential learning that you've experienced with Impact. So, how do you how have you found that methodology works for you and your organisation? Do you think that that method of development helps learners f- focus better back when they go when they when they go back to work? I, I will start with uh, how I see experiential learning, and then mm. the second part of the question just after. Yeah, but. Do. What makes experiential learning unique for me is that it anchors the learning deeply for the participants. I mm. mentioned earlier in my introduction that I like to keep a holistic view on people and experiential learning tap into the mental level. Uh, participants are out of their comfort zone. They have to focus more because the context and the task at hand are unknown, so they cannot rely anymore on their automatic response and automatic brain. So that's mental level. At emotional level, through the bonding with the group, uh, whether they knew each other before or not, they will recall this experience each time they meet. And uh, they share much more at a personal level than they would do in the professional context. Mm. On the physical level, that depends on the activities that we put in the mix, of course, but uh, (laughs) um, they have to call upon all their senses. Some activities are quite physical and challenging as well. So that really brings another brain, I would say, into the the learning. And overall, I love the fact that uh, this makes the experience memorable, uh, which grounds the learning very deep. So participate will, participants will associate a specific learning to the experience. It will stick. I'm convinced of that. Also, most activities are run as a group uh, where, where there is collaboration ongoing. We depend on each other at some point. And those are amazing occasion for feedback. For those familiar with the Johari window, the experiential learning gives participants an incredible opportunity to open up the window as they open up to others. They confront their blind spot and sometimes they step both feet into their unknown quadrant from the Joari window. Um, I will give a, a concrete example to, to illustrate that because it's, it might be a bit uh, fuzzy for now. But in our first group at the Lake District, an afternoon was spent uh, with activities involving some climbing Mm -hmm. and uh, fun ways to go back down from jumping to upsailing. And one participant was very clear from the start, I'm not doing that. I'm happy to join. I will support the other. I will secure. I will cheer. (laughs) But I don't want to do it, which was absolutely fine for everybody. Mm -hmm. So off we go. He came, he put on on the gears because you need the gear also to do the the, 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 the supporting part. Mm-hmm. And he, he secured other, he cheered them up. And then at some point, he changed his mind and he decided to give it a go. And he did both. He went for it and he did it. And the look on his face after he has done that was really priceless. And the point I'm saying with the 
unknown blog is that it opened new possibilities for him. He never saw himself as a daring person. And after that, he could see himself becoming a daring leader. So yeah. that's, that's what I mean by sometimes you step into your unknown. Now, coming back to the second part of your question, will that help participants focus better back in the workplace? Well, I wouldn't keep doing it if I didn't believe it does, because at the end of the training, all participants talk about the value of taking a step back, changing perspective, mm -hmm. and most important, uh, taking time. And that comes, that's the link I make with, with focus, being intentional mm -hmm. and spending time on what matters. So even though they might revert back to some old habits, um, I choose to believe they are not running in circles, but they are on a spiral up. That's we can we can plant seeds, but we need to give it time to sprout. Yeah, I, there's a few picks, a few parts there I wanted to to kind of go back to. I think first of all, I, I, as you were talking there about the participants' experience with an activity that they've they've done. Uh, with impact in the Lake District is um, I, I've been very fortunate in my career at impact to to see firsthand those uh, what we often lovingly refer to as pivotal moments we see these points in people's lives where they find themselves in an uncomfortable situation maybe start by as you've mentioned observing it to begin with and then decide to take a moment to take it take a step out of that comfort zone and try something a calculated risk challenge by choice and then ultimately what can come from it is like can be life-changing to the point where that individual will have gone away from that experience with a totally new outlook on the way that they approach their work their life whatever and i, I think that that's that the, that is something particularly special and again i've been fortunate enough to see a lot of through working here um and it and you're right there'll have been a there'll have been an absolute rush of adrenaline after because i know the activities that you're talking about uh and to give to be a bit more descriptive it's that we have a a telegraph pole with a um a, a, the, uh, which the idea is to climb to the top of it and then jump off and get lowered down and harness whilst trying to to, uh, and with you you've got your whole team supporting you literally holding the rope that holds you up um, and the yeah the adrenaline rush that it gives you is is something else particularly if you're not used to doing anything like that you know um so I, and it, and it's and i think the learning from that of course is is that he'll have gone away and reflected on that and gone okay well where where can i apply this back at work um and where can i say okay well i wouldn't normally do this but maybe i should just try and I, yeah i think that that's that uh it is it is super powerful and it's always nice to hear it when other people go through those experiences as well and the reason why i mentioned this one is because uh there is one of the value within a gs and that's probably the value we still need to uh amp up a bit so this was a, a beautiful example yeah, absolutely. I think that's I think that's right. Remind me of those uh, that I think dare, share, care, and deliver. Yeah, so I think there's definitely the dare part is there. Isn't it? <laughs> um, and I think I, to to also kind of follow on from what we've just been talking about is that those those experiences, in terms of focus, the first of all, there's I think there's that there's that part of um, being in an experience with other people i think will help focus because there'll be a whole team working around one or maybe multiple um end goals um but there's there's all the kind of things that we've been talking about in this episode about uh individual commitment individual um preferences but also team like supporting your team to go through the same experiences or work towards the same thing um i so there's yeah it's kind of a nice summary there uh, of of essentially what we've been talking about in this in this episode um, and, and one more link that that comes to my mind as you 
highlight that is there are very specific objective to reach mm. within each of those experience. But it, I think what's interesting about it is that those, again, we try to make it as simulatory as possible where anything within that experience could change itself. The outcome could change because as soon as it's applied back to your context or the client's context, that's when things can totally change from the original outcome, but in a, in a positive way. Uh, yeah, that's super fascinating. And it's, again, I, I feel fortunate and privileged that I get to hear those positive stories come from, from people that we work with. So that's, that's really cool. We mentioned at the top of the episode uh, that, that uh, you've kind of devoted your life to people development. And at one, one part of your career, you uh, were an aerospace engineer. And, uh, and you did that for quite a long time before moving into and following your passion into people development. It, you're also I've come to discover that you're a Pilates instructor in, instructor as well so you've kind of kind of gone through your own journey and is is it uh, and that when it comes to focus how how has your personal journey and what has it been about your personal journey that's taught you about where to get get energy from and how to harness that focus well, the term energy is super important to understand a bit my journey and um, rather than, yeah, it's a journey, but I also see it as a, as an image and I'm putting pieces of the puzzle together as I go through the journey when it comes mm -hmm. to my um, professional uh, path. But um, I've learned that we, we get, each get our energy from very different things and that it's important to identify that for ourselves. Uh, that's some work we all need to do. And once we figure that out, to respect it. So I shared earlier that I'm interested in plenty of topics. Uh, they are somehow all linked to personal development. Uh, and I would never force myself to become a topical expert. That's one of the reasons why I left uh, engineering, aerospace engineering, because at that time, I felt that to progress further in that field, I had to become expert in a very tiny uh, domain, which was really freaking me out. Mm. <laughs> well, I have peers from university who thrive on that. So nevertheless, although it's very personal, I think there are a couple of elements that could speak to uh, a number of people out there. So, so to harness focus, I believe that a healthy lifestyle is foundational. Mm -hmm. um, I spend a lot of time exercising, uh, disconnecting, uh, spending time, quality time with my family. Mm -hmm. Very careful about limiting uh, distraction. You won't find me in social media, maybe apart from once a week on, on my LinkedIn, having a chat, checking on, on what has been uh, said in a few groups that I follow. Another rule that I try to live by is to create before I consume, uh, which usually doesn't leave much time to consume. So it's a upward spiral as well for me. Could you give an example of create? Yeah, yourself. well, uh, set yourself to uh, finish one one task before you go read your uh, emails, for example, mm -hmm. or you go find some news, or or you go on any type of social media, do something that needs to be done and that only you can can uh, move forward. Now, yeah. uh, sorry. Sorry. Well, I was just going to say, yeah. I mean, I the, there's. So many things that I've just been self-reflecting there and going, yep, I need to change that. I need to, because <laughs> I, I, I get so easily distracted. Um, it's uh, to the point where, it, yeah, I, I, find, I do, there are times where I do find it hard to focus and I don't think I've yet identified those parameters and, and kind of set, had that figured out what works best for me in terms of getting the best focus. And by parameter, I, I invite you to, to look very broadly. So we talked about, is there a space that works better for you? Mm. Is there a time that works better for you? Are there some kind of rituals you can put in place? Uh, we, we see that when we have very young kids, we usually put a ritual before bedtime so that mm. they are getting prepared for That's bedtime. Very true. Could be the same for your focus moment. Uh, is there any, something you, you can do like, 
always go grab a, a big glass of water and bring it to you with you at your desk, finding some rituals that put your brains into the, into the routine of going into a focus time block, I would say. And linking another, back to, yeah. Another, yeah, another one I heard actually, which was um, quite a good one, particularly if you don't have, if you, if your, if your week isn't led by meetings where other people are scheduling your calendar for you, is uh, this was, in fact, this was featured on an episode of our very, very first podcast back in 2020, uh, and that was um, calendar blocking, which uh, I, I'd not really done before. Um, but actually, that one's quite a useful one where you essentially, if you've got, if you, you shouldn't, as in theory, have white space in your calendar, it should all be filled up with something and that's giving you time to kind of focus on a particular project. Um, that one's quite a nice one, which again, I need to implement probably. <laughs> Indeed. And it's, it's, it was my next point about putting some structure mm. around, around protecting your energy and having this focus time. In, in my case, it's indeed with, I know I'm more able to focus early in the day. Um, I'm lucky enough that my kids are now old enough to take care of themselves in the morning. So I can really either at work or at home start very early when most of my colleagues are not yet working. So I, I have those two hours block. I may not respect them every morning, but I have those two hours block for which I know beforehand what I'm going to do with those. So I, I'm starting the day not on my email, my Outlook opens on the calendar view and each of these block as a deliverable. And I don't mm. have to ask myself, what will I work on? I know what's my finish line and I just dive into that while I'm fresh, but it works for me. Yeah, exactly. And I think that what I'm kind of picking up there is that it's, there's a, again, going back to it's, it's, a, it's good if you can kind of recognize your own preferences um and i think that what in an ideal world if you find yourself in a kind of a line management position where you could work alongside if you could work alongside with your line manager to find, figure out what works best for you as well um because everybody's so different especially when you know nowadays more and more neurodiversity is is becoming is coming to the surface and i think that each, each people's everybody's like learning styles and, and people's working styles differ so wildly but uh what 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 some what some people what can work for one person would totally not work for another um so it's um and i think you know if 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 leaders can work alongside their people to and their teams to figure out what works best for each individual, then that's going to have a knock-on effect and reverberate throughout other teams and into the rest of the organizational culture as a whole, I would have thought. And that's typically where you see this role of coach mm. inside the leader. Uh, you don't bring the solution. You bring the space and you bring the questions and structure maybe. Uh, to have the person reflect on that and come up with their own solution that works for them. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Well, now we've actually reached our final question, which are, it's, um, it always goes super fast when, you, when you're learning a lot, so I can't believe we've got there quite so quickly. Uh, but w our last question to you is um, the same question we ask all of our guests, which is if you were to start your career all uh, again, um, what would be the best piece of advice you would give yourself? I had such a long list of advice I wanted to give myself. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the one that stood in the end uh, when I had to pick one for, for today mm -hmm. was one that I keep reminding myself uh, very often. And it's when running into difficult situation or uncomfortable situation, be fascinated rather than frustrated. That's a, a, a lovely way to think about. Uh, yeah, I, I, I can already think of lots of situations where I've had that Im immediate reaction first without thinking thinking things through. So yeah, that's a, and, a, and it's also nice to hear that you still live by that every, every day because I, I do often ask our guests whether they do live by their advice to their younger self. And whether they well, uh, in terms <laughs> of personality, I'm I'm, work, I'm tending more to be a 
uh, yeah, I don't really like the term, but uh, more of a judging person. I feel that I know the answer and that it should be that way and not that one. And I have to be very careful about that. And one way to shift that behavior for me is to get very, very curious uh, towards yeah. other, towards myself, towards situations. So that's why it's it's a work in progress. <laughs> Yeah, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. Well, Sejlen, thank you ever so much for uh, joining us today. It's been a great conversation. And thank you for, for yeah, as I say, taking time out of your day to, to join us. Uh, and that just remains me to thank you again for listening and watching wherever you are finding this episode. And don't forget that, of course, we've got a back catalogue, which you can go uh, and watch and listen to wherever you find your podcasts. If you would like to find out anything more about Impact, or if you'd like to connect with either myself or Sergeline on LinkedIn, uh, you can go ahead and find all of the links that you need in the description of this episode. So that just remains for me to thank Sergeline again for joining me today. And until the next time, take care. Hey, you know my mind, you know. Oh, the, the, the.